In order to maintain the female victim identity, feminists need men's identity to simultaneously be perpetrator and protector. How can they possibly achieve that? HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen Men, the victim identity cult really wants their concern for you acknowledged. They want it so much they can't wait to tell you all about their astounding level of compassion. Really, they're just chomping at the bit, fidgeting with anxiety over the men's movement's disturbing lack of acknowledgement of just how much feminists really do care about men. So much, in fact, that you just have to listen or no one can believe you also care about men, even if you are one. What's wrong with you, you misandric jerks? So, what do they want to talk about? Toxic masculinity, of course. It's such a terrible, horrible, burdensome problem that it supersedes all of the issues the men's movement exists to discuss. It might even be bigger than feminist issues, bigger than the pay gap, rape culture, even bigger than mansplaining. Why, it's even bigger than the fact that patriarchy hurts men, too. Why? Because it's the underlying cause behind every issue that has ever happened anywhere. If it's not a direct cause, it's the cause of the conditions that led to the direct cause. Seriously, there isn't anything feminists can't trace back to it. It's probably even the reason why your chewing gum lost its flavor on the bedpost overnight. And uh, what exactly is toxic masculinity? We hear a lot about its symptoms, most of which can be distilled down to the supposed normalization of selfish, crass buffoonery that 13-year-olds think is funny, but mostly grow beyond by the time they're adults. You know, things dads who haven't been evicted from their families train their sons out of as they're growing up, in part by telling them such behaviors are childish and unmanly. To what does the toxic masculinity narrative attribute this alleged normalization? Supposedly that is caused by social attitudes, but the cult's narratives only describe those attitudes in terms of men's and boys' responses to them. Stoicism, promiscuity, contempt for women, violent aggression, all based on the presumed expectations of the people around them as dictated by some agreed-upon image of what constitutes a real man. You know, the kind of thing boys might learn growing up if their elder role models are all their neighborhood bullies or distant representations they only experience through their female role models' complaints or from stories on television and in movies. Things they might learn in an environment characterized by a society-wide compassion deficit toward men and boys. How awful, right? But who would create such an environment? Feminists tell us that the male suicide rate is so much higher than the female suicide rate because our society doesn't allow men to cry enough, to express their feelings, to talk about their problems, so they keep them bottled up until the pain becomes too much. Unable to handle it anymore, they self-destruct. Ignoring for a moment the fact that guys heal psychologically through doing, not just through crying, though they can express that way, Let's consider the idea that feminists have proposed. Men, they tell us, should be, quote, allowed to express their emotions and talk about their problems. Okay, so who's stopping them? Who is it that decides which emotions men are allowed to have and which they may not? When a man faces a false accusation of reprehensible behavior, who treats his outrage and anger at being the subject of shocking and humiliating lies as evidence of his guilt? Who calls every false accusation that is exposed to the public a chance to start a conversation about the type of perpetration the accuser has alleged, yet adamantly refuses to have any conversation about the incidents and impact of false accusations themselves? When advocates for male victims of female perpetrated intimate partner and sexual violence speak up about their experiences and their recovery needs, who responds by downplaying the rate of incidents and the impact of victims' experiences? Who deflects to discussion on male perpetration? Who accuses men who want the right to self-defense of wanting an excuse to beat women? Who accuses men's advocates of trying to use male victims to downplay women's experiences? Who? in every discussion on the topic, no matter how it started, 
treats male victims as invaders trespassing on female territory. Who tells them men should sit down, shut up, and wait until the female victims are done talking? Who is it that responds to men's complaints about unfair treatment in family court by demonizing them as deadbeats, abusers, liars, and thieves of parenting time who are only trying to hurt the mothers of their children? Who castigates alienated fathers for expressing pain and sadness in response to their circumstances? Who mocks their separation anxiety, or worse, calls it creepy? When alienated fathers like Thomas Ball and Chris Mackney commit suicide as a result of the impact of corrupt family court decisions on their lives, who is it that accuses them of doing it as a last-ditch way to abuse their ex-wives? Who responds to men's issues discussion online by calling the men involved a bunch of whiny man-babies who don't actually do anything, then driving activists like Earl Silverman to suicide when they do try to do something, and finally calling the suicide itself an attack on feminists. The feminist message is apparently, we want you to show emotion, but only when your interests don't conflict with feminist narratives. We want you to cry, but only about feminist-approved problems. Any other expression of self-interest is bad, and shame on you for even thinking about it. What do you get when you raise boys in an environment like that? where they're surrounded by feminine mentors and ugly, openly disdained representations of masculinity, told they should be more open and expressive, and then demonized for expressing any self-interest. When their caregivers, the gods of their world, promise compassion, but deliver condemnation instead. You get male feminists. How would a person deal with being raised, not as a potential contributor to the greatness of society, but as the cause of all of its evils, with little useful guidance on how to make himself an asset rather than a detriment to society. He'd find a demon to be the cause of his corruption, something that could be exercised, or something that could be blamed any time he happens to offend, something like toxic masculinity. While many young men who adopt feminist narratives do so with the best of intentions, believing it to be the wisest outlet for their mostly traditional chivalry, most grow out of their misconceptions and leave the movement for more productive ways to interact with the world. However, the excuse provided by the toxic masculinity narrative would be an attractive tool for a scam artist or a predator, just as it is to those among feminist women. Toxic masculinity caused my bad behavior is the devil made me do it of feminism. It's an excellent blame sink. Said the wrong thing in front of your gender studies professor? Shed a few tears, abase yourself, and apologize. Sorry, ma'am, that was a manifestation of toxic masculinity, wasn't it? Golly, gee, my bad. I have learned so much from this experience. You're such a great teacher. Exit classroom left at an emotionally liberated pace. Just remember, if confronted by this feminist, whatever bad thing it is he is doing, you just have to teach him not to do it anymore, and it's all good. Groper, no groping! Groper, no groping! Groper, no groping! Aw, oh, man! It's the perfect tool for a bully, too. You just have to do it in the name of protecting women from other men's toxic masculinity. In that context, it becomes the perfect rationalization for othering, especially at the behest of feminist women who openly demand it with poster campaigns, campus initiatives, even speeches to the United Nations. Got some pent-up aggression? Well, somewhere on the internet there's an anti-feminist or men's advocate right now who needs to hear from a feminist man immediately. Why this intervention could be key to preventing an incident of male violence. Not that the feminist bully knows anything firsthand about male violence, of course, because he's never started any fights. He's only defended women against other men who looked like they might be getting ready to do something unfeminist. Besides, it's not aggression when you're heading toxic masculinity off at the pass, right? The feminist bully isn't the bad guy. You are. You'd better not forget that, either, be you male or female. If you're going to discuss human rights issues from a gender equality perspective, you'd better be ready to submit your ideas for approval by the Toxic Masculinity Avenger. No, he's not the hero men need. He's not the hero women need. He's the hero feminists demanded. 
After all, we can't have people thinking for themselves without the cult's supervision, can we? And how is that not toxic?